All right, this is going to be a quick video here. Section was um, 1820 to 1860. In 1826, Americans took great pride in the 50 years of independence. A unique political system based on a written constitution had proven practical and flexible, enough to permit territorial growth and industrial change. The United States had a both central government and a collection of self-governing states. However, many citizens resisting giving up powers to a national government in the first two political parties. The Federalists and the Democratic Republicans had expressed strong regional differences. In short, although the United States was young and vibrant in the 1820s, it was still a fragile union. Uh, so although it was a young nation, it's still very fragile. There's still a lot of weaknesses. That's what they're saying. And you're going to see that in this chapter. The previous chapter treated the nation as a whole in the 1800s. Uh, this uh, chapter will look at differences amongst the three sections, the North, South, and the West. Daniel Webster, in the opening quotation of this chapter, rhetorically refers to these three sections in terms of the four main points of the compass as he attempts to portray the dangers that these divisions uh, hold for the nation. By examining sexual differences, we can understand the sectionalism uh, that mainly led to the Union's worst crisis. Civil War. So this is looking at the cause of the Civil Wars through the differences with the North, South, and the West. So understand that. Well, let's look at the North. The northern portion of the country in the 19th century contained two parts, the Northeast, which included New England and Middle Atlantic, and the Old Northwest, which looked at Ohio to Minnesota. The northern states were bound together by transportation routes and rapid economic growth based on commercial farming and the industrial innovation. While manufacturing was expanding, the vast majority of the northerners were still involved in agriculture. The north was the most populous section in the country, and as a result of uh, both a high, as a result of the high birth rate and increased immigration, so the north had a higher population, and most people were still farmers. The industrial northeast. So, looking at the north, let's look at the northeast. Originally, the industrial revolution centered in the textile industry, but by the 1830s, northern factories were producing a wide range of good, everything from farm implements to clocks and shoes. So, there's a diversity in the economy of factories. Organized labor. Uh, industrial development meant that large numbers of people who had once earned their living as independent farmers and artisans became dependent on wages and earned in the factory. With the common workplace, low pay, long hours, and unsafe working conditions, urban workers in different cities organized both unions and local political parties to protect their interests. The first U.S. Labor Party founded in Philly in 1828 succeeded in electing a few members of the city council. For a brief period in the 1830s, an increasing number of urban workers joined unions and participated in strikes. So there's starting to be some organized labor and some form of strikes by the 1820s, 1830s. Organized labor archived, uh, achieved sorry, one noble victory in 1842. When Massachusetts, uh, the Supreme Court, ruled in Commonwealth vs. Hunt that peaceful unions had the right to negotiate labor contracts with employers. During the 1840s and 1850s, most state legislators in the North passed laws establishing a 10-hour workday. Improvement for workers, however, continued to be limited by periodic depressions, uh, employers and courts that were hostile unions, and an abundant supply of cheap immigrant labor. So um, you need to understand there were some gains. Commonwealth vs. Hunt said that unions are legal and can organize peacefully and could negotiate. However, there were still a lot of big problems. Uh, there were weaknesses that resulted in abundant work supply. So they could just basically dissolve, fire people, uh, whatever. Urban life. The North's urban population grew from approximately 5% of the population in 1800 to 15% by 1850. As a result of such rapid growth in cities from Boston to Baltimore, slums also expanded. Crowded housing, poor sanitation, infectious diseases, high rates of crime soon became characteristic of large working class neighborhoods. Nevertheless, new opportunities in cities offered by Industrial Revolution continued to attract both Native Americans from farms and immigrants from Europe. Native born Americans, sorry, from farms and Americans from Europe. So urban life was mostly in the north, of course, a lot of disease, poor sanitation, but still it was growing. African Americans. The 250,000 African Americans who lived in the north uh, constituted about 1% in 1860. However, they represent 50% of all free African Americans. Freedom may have meant that they could maintain a family and in some instances own land, but did not mean economic or political equality. Since strong racial prejudices kept them from voting and holding jobs in most skilled professions and crafts, in the mid 1800s, immigrants displaced them from uh, for from occupation and jobs they had um, had since the Seventh Revolution. Uh, 
Denied membership in unions, African Americans were often hired as strike breakers and often dismissed after the strike ended. So most of the free African Americans were in the North, even though only 1% actually of African Americans lived in the North. Um, however, there were still a lot of racial prejudices that were involved. The agricultural Northwest. The old Northwest consisted of six states uh, west of the Hellenes that were admitted to Union before 1860, getting Ohio, Indiana, Illinois, Michigan, Wisconsin, and Minnesota. These states came from territories out of land ceded to the national government in the 1780s uh, by one of the original 13 states. The procedure for turning these territories into states was part of the Northwest added ordinance, which passed in 1787. So basically saying is 1787. When they uh, outlined the ter- or when they outlined the terms and how to become a state, uh, these states were added. In the early years of the 19th century, much of the old Northwest was unsettled frontier, and part of it was that it settled re- re- that was settled relied upon the Mississippi to transport grain to southern markets via New Orleans. By mid-century, however, this region became closely tied to the northern states by two factors, military, military campaigns by federal troops that drove American Indians from the land, and the development of canals. So this place had become developed because of canals, access to rivers, trade, the steamboat, but also because uh, you're getting federal troops that are moving Native Americans more westward. Agriculture. In the states of the old Northwest, crops of corn and wheat were very profitable. Using the newly invented steel plow by John Deere and mechanical reaper by Cyrus McCormick, a farm family was more efficient and could plant more acres. Needing supplements labor only with a few hired workers at harvest time, part of the crop was used to feed cattle and hogs and apply to supply distillers and brewers with grain, making whiskey and beer. Farmers shipped grain quickly to cities to avoid spoilage. So think about agriculture, grain was very important, farmland was very important, and of course the steel plow and the uh, Reaper were very important to allow this um, movement westward. New cities, a key transportation point, small villages and towns grew in all thriving cities after 1820. Buffalo, Cleveland, Detroit, and Chicago on the Great Lakes, Cincinnati and Ohio River, and St. Louis, St. Louis and the Mississippi River. The city served as transfer points, processing farm products for shipment to the east and distributing manufactured goods from the east to the region. So trade was very important between the um, the Northwest as well as the East. Immigration. In 1820, about 8,000 immigrants arrived from Europe. Beginning in 1832, there was a sudden increase. After that year, the number of new arrivals um, never fell below 50,000 a year. In 1854, it climbed as high as 428,000. From the 1830s to the 1850s, nearly 4 million people from the Northern Europe across the Atlantic to seek a new life in the United States. Arriving by ship in the northern seacoats of seacoast cities of Boston, New York, and Philadelphia, many immigrants remained where they landed, while others traveled to farms and cities of the old Northwest. Few journeyed to the South, where the plantation economy and slavery limited the opportunities of free labor. So most of these immigrants were going to either the North, East, they would stay, or they would move to the Northwest. Very few would go to the South because of opportunities. The surge in immigration between 1830 and 1860 was chiefly as a result of a few things. Number one, inexpensive and relatively rapid ocean transportation, famines and revolutions in Europe, and also the growing reputation of the United States. So pull, push and pull factors. Uh, so a lot of people wanted to move uh, to the United States because it was cheaper to, um, because sea travel was cheaper. But there were a lot of uh, famines and revolutions, such as the Irish potato famine in Europe. And also the United States was a land of opportunity. So these are a couple of groups. First, we got the Irish. During this period, half of the immigrants, almost 2 million, came from Ireland. These Irish immigrants were mostly tenant farmers driven from their homeland by potato crop failures and a devastating famine in the 1840s. They arrived with limited interest in farming, few special skills, and money. Uh, they were heavily discriminated against because they were Catholic. Uh, they worked very hard at whatever employment they could find, uh, usually competing with African Americans for domestic work and unskilled labor jobs. They were faced, however, with limited opportunities. They congregated for mutual support in northern cities. Uh, they typically lived in ghettos in Boston, Philadelphia, and New York, where they had first landed. Many Irish entered politics. They organized their fellow immigrants and joined the Democratic Party, which had long traditions of anti-British feelings and support for workers. Uh, their progress was difficult but steady. For example, the Irish were initially excluded from joining New York City's Democratic organizations, Tammany Hall. By 1850s, they had secured jobs influence, and by 1880s, they controlled this party organization. 
So a lot of the Irish were coming over from the uh, from Ireland because of the potato famine. They were heavily discriminated against, um, and they would typically stay in northern cities such as Boston, Philly, and New York. Boston Celtics, for example, Germans. Uh, both economic hardships and the failure of Demo- Democratic Revolution in 1848. Caused more than 1 million Germans to seek refugee in the United States in the 40s and 50s. Most German immigrants had at least modest means as well as considerable skills as farmers and artisans. Moving westward in search of cheap, fertile farmland, they established homesteads throughout Old Northwest and generally prospered. At first, their political influence was limited as they became more active in public life. Many uh, strongly supported public education and staunchly opposed slavery. Um, yeah, so, I mean, that's pretty self-explanatory. Germans... They were very skilled farmers and artisans. That's very important to understand. Now we're getting nativists. These people were anti-immigrant. Many native-born Americans were alarmed by the influx of immigrants, uh, fearing that newcomers would take their jobs uh, and weaken American culture of the Anglo majority. The nativists were Protestants who distrusted Roman Catholics uh, practiced by the Irish and many of the Germans. In the 1840s, opposition to immigrants led to sporadic rioting in the big cities and the organization of secret anti-foreign society. Supreme Court, the Star Spangled Banner, the society turned to politics in the 1850s, nominating candidates uh, for office as the American Party or No Nothing Party. Anti-foreign feelings faded in importance in the North and South, divided over slavery in the Civil War. However, nativism would periodically return here and then. Um, so you understand as you're getting people that are against the new immigrants. They felt that they were taking jobs, but as well as, uh, of course, um, taking away from the American identity. The South. The states that permitted slavery formed a distinctive re- uh, region, the South. By 1861, this included 15 states, all of which were all before Delaware, Maryland, Kentucky, and Missouri ceded and uh, joined the Confederacy. To cede and join the Confederacy. Agriculture and King Cotton. Agriculture was the founding foundation of South South's economy, even though by 1850, small factories in the region were producing about 15% of the nation's manufactured goods. Tobacco, rice, and sugarcane were important cash crops, but these far exceeded the South's uh, chief economic activity, the production and sale of cotton. So all in all, you just want to understand, cotton is king. That's still most of the um, where the economy is coming in. Um, although... Uh, there was a rise of factories, or there was an increase in factories. The development of the mechanized textile mills in England, coupled with the Eli Cotton, Eli Whitney's cotton gin, made cotton the most cotton cloth affordable, not just in Europe and the United States, but throughout the world. Before 1860, the world depended on chiefly Britain's mills for its supply of cloth, and Britain, in turn, depended chiefly on the American South for its supply of cotton fiber. Originally, the cotton was grown almost entirely in two states, South Carolina and Georgia, but as demand and profits increased, planted moved westward in Alabama, Mississippi, Louisiana, and Texas. New land was constantly needed for the high cotton yields uh, required for profits quickly depleted by soil. By the 1850s, the cotton provided two-thirds of all U.S. exports and linked the South and Great Britain. Cotton is king. Uh, so a couple of things you understand is Great Britain depended on southern cotton for trade, because uh, they would produce, of course, clothes. Um, so they, they would have that allegiance or an alliance, I guess you could say. Slavery, the peculiar institution. Wealth in the South uh, was measured in terms of land and slaves. The latter were treated as a form of property subject to being bought and sold. However, some whites were sensitive about how they treat other humans. They referred to slavery as that peculiar institution. In colonial times, people justify slavery as economic necessity, but 19th century apologists for slavery mustered historical and religious arguments to support their claim. So by this time, although people knew it was morally wrong, they would find uh, ways to use religious doctrine to justify the needs for slavery. Population. The cotton boom was largely responsible for an increase in number of slaves, from 1 million in 1800 to nearly 4 million in 1860. Most of the increase came from natural growth, although thousands of Africans were also smuggled in the South in violation of the 1808 law against importing slaves. In parts of the Deep South, slaves up to much as 75% of the total population. Fearing slave revolts, Southern legislature added increased restrictions on movement and education in their slave codes. So that's crazy. Uh, 75%. Um, slaves made up as much as 75% of the total population in the South, which shows the reliance on slavery.
economics. Slaves were employed doing whatever their owners demanded to them. Most slaves labored in the fields, but many learned uh, skills, crafts, or worked as servants in factories. Now, construction gangs. Because of the greater profits to be made upon new cotton plantations in the West, many slaves were sold uh, from the upper south to the cotton rich deep south of the lower Mississippi River. By 1860, the value of, field, of a field slave had arisen to the amount of $2,000. One result of the happy capital investment slaves was that the south um, had much less capital than the north to undertake its industrialization. Um, so slaves, I mean, they would do – that just talk about the variety of jobs that they would have, whether it's craft, factories, or, or – um, yeah, house servants. Slave life. Conditions of slavery varied from one plantation to the next. Some slaves were humanely treated, while others were routinely beaten. All suffered from being deprived of their freedom. Uh, families could be separated at any time by an owner's decision to sell a wife, a husband, or a child. Women were vulnerable to sexual exploitation. Despite the hard, a nearly hopeless circumstance in their lives, enslaved African Americans maintaining a strong sense of family and a religious faith. So this is talking about some uh, conditions are going to be diverse, but overall there's obviously a lack of freedom. Resistance. Slaves contested uh, their status through a range of range of actions, uh, primarily work slowdown, sabotage, and escape. Conditions there were very few major slave uprisings. One was led by Denmark Vesey in 1822, another by Nat Turner in 1831. The revolts were quickly and violently suppressed, but even so, they had a lasting impact. Uh, they gave hope to enslaved African Americans, drove southern states, tightened uh, already strict slave codes, and demonstrated too many of the evils of slavery. The revolts polarized the country by making slaveholders more defensive about slavery and not slaveholders more critical of the institution. So there were slave results that existed. The one that you want to make sure you understand is Nat Turner. Um, but this would just lead to heightening of slave codes. Free African Americans. By 1860, as many as 250,000 African Americans in the South were not slaves. They were free citizens. Uh, a number of slaves had been emancipated during the American Revolution. Uh, some were mulatto children whose white fathers had decided to liberate them. Others achieved freedom on their own when permitted through self purchase. They were fortunate enough to have been paid wages for extra work, usually as skilled craftspeople. Most of the free Southern blacks lived in cities where they could own property. Um, but by state law, they were not equal to whites. They were not permitted to vote and were barred from entering certain occupations. Certainly in danger of being kidnapped by slave traders, they had to show legal papers proving their free status. They remained in the South for various reasons. Some wanted to be near family members who were still in bondage. Others believed the South to be home, nor to offer no greater opportunities. So there were very few slaves that were free. Um, however, they were still not equal, and in fact, sometimes they'd have to carry their slave papers with them, or free papers, to ensure that they were not kidnapped. White society. Southern whites observed a rigid hierarchy among themselves. Aristotic planners lived comfortably in the top society, while poor farmers and mountain people struggled at the bottom. Aristocracy. Remember the South small lead of wealthy plant owners earned at least 100 slaves. Uh, and at least a thousand acres. The planter aristocracy maintained in power by dominating the state legislature of the South and enacting laws uh, favored large uh, holders' interests. So there were very few of them that owned at least 100 slaves and a thousand acres, but they owned the government, right? They dominated the state legislature. Uh, all the laws that they would create would favor them. Farmers. The vast majority of the slaveholders owned fewer than 20 slaves and worked only had several hundred acres. Uh, Southern white farmers produced the bulk of the cotton crop, worked in the fields with their slaves, and lived in as modestly as farmers in the north. Um, yeah, so typically most owned fewer than 20 slaves. Poor whites, three-fourths of the South's white population owned no slaves. So most of the population of the whites did not have slaves. They could not afford the rich uh, river bottom farmland controlled by the planters, and many lived in the hills as subsistence farmers. These hillbillies, or poor white trash, as they were uh, derisively called by the planters, defended the slave system, thinking that someday they too could own slaves. At least they were superior on the social scale as some slaves. So three-fourths of the population were poor whites that were, yeah, I mean, just not good farmers, and they were hillbillies. But they uh, they th thought that slavery was a lifestyle, and it brought them hope. Mountain people. A number of the small farmers lived in frontier conditions and isolation uh, the rest of the south, along the slopes and valleys of the Appalachians and Ozark Mountains. Mountain people disliked the planters and their slaves. During the Civil War, many, uh, including a future president, Andrew Jackson, would remain loyal to the Union. Andrew Johnson, sorry, would remain loyal to the Union. Cities. 
Uh, because the South is primarily an agricultural region, there was only limited major cities. New Orleans was the only major southern city, one of the nation's 15 largest. Um, cities such as Atlanta, Charleston, Chattanooga, and Richmond were important trading centers, but relatively had a small population compared to those of the North. So most of the cities, of course, were in the North. Southern thought. The South uh, developed a unique culture and outlook in life. As cotton became the base of its economy, slavery became the focus of its political thought. White Southerners increasingly felt isolated and defensive about slavery, as Northerners grew hostile towards it. And as Great Britain, France, and other European nations outlawed it all together, some more nations were outlawing it all together. The North one outlawed it, but of course the South was very defensive about doing so. The Code of Chivalry, dominated by the aristocratic planner class, the agriculture South was largely a feudal society. Southern gentlemen ascribed to a code of chivalrous conduct, which included a strong sense of personal honor, the defense of womanhood, and patriotic attitudes toward all who are deemed inferior, especially slaves. So they saw the slaves as, as superior, right? Southern gentlemen were superior. Education. The upper class valued a college education for their children. Uh, acceptable possessions for gentlemen were limited to farming, uh, law, ministry, and military. For the lower classes, schooling beyond early elementary age is not available. It reduced the risk of slave revolts. Slaves are strictly prohibited from receiving any instruction. So slaves are not allowed to be um, educated as well. Um, most of uh, the lower class did not have anything beyond elementary schooling. However, the upper class did have access to uh, college education. Religion. Uh, the slavery question affected the church and membership partly because they preached biblical and support for slavery. Both Methodists and Baptist churches gained in membership. Um, the South was splitting in the 1840s with the Northern Brethren. The Unitarians who challenged slavery faced declining membership and hostility. Hostility. Catholics and Epis uh, Episcopalians looked at, took neutral stance on slavery. So let's talk about the West. So the paragraph above that just talked about religion, and there was a lot of divisiveness on slavery. The West. As the United States expanded westward, the definition of the West kept changing. In the 1600s, the West referred to all lands not along the Atlantic coast. Uh, in the 1700s, the West meant lands on the other side of the Appalachian Mountains. By the mid-1800s, the West lay beyond the Mississippi River and reached the California, uh, Oregon Territory, and the Pacific Coast. So it's talking about the American Indians. Uh, the original settlers of the West and the entire North American continent were various groups of American Indians. However, from the time of Columbus, American Indians were cajoled, pushed, or driven westward as white settlers encroached on their homelands. Exodus. By 1850, the vast majority of the American Indians were killed living west of the Mississippi River. Those to the east were either killed by disease, died in battles, emigrated, reluctantly, or had been forced to leave their land by treaty or military action. The Great Plains, however, would provide only a temporary um, respite for the conflict of white settlers. So most had died as a result of disease, or they were forced to move westward through the Trail of Tears. Uh, life on the Plains. Horses um, brought to America by Spanish in the 1500s revolutionized life for the uh, American Indians, the Great Plains. Some tribes continued to live in villages and farms, mm -hmm. but the horse allowed tribes such as the Cheyenne and the Sioux to become nomadic hunters following the buffalo. Uh, those living a nomadic way of life could more easily move from advancing settlers or opposed to encroachments by force. The frontier. Although the location of the western frontier consistently shifted, the concept of the frontier remained the same from generation to generation. Same forces had bought the original colonists in the Americas and motivated their descendants and new immigrants to move westward. In the public imagination, uh, the west was represented the possibility of a fresh start for those willing to venture there. In fact, um, at least in theory, the, the West beckoned as a plane of greater freedom for all that ethnic groups, American Indians, African Americans, uh, European Americans, and eventually Asian Americans as well. So the frontier was the West. It was kind of a look at it, new opportunities. Mountain men. From the point of view of white Americans, the Rocky Mountains in the 1820s were a far distant frontier, a total wilderness, except for American Indian villages. The earliest whites in the area had uh, followed Lewis and Clark and explored American Indian trails as they trapped furs. These mountain men, as they were called, served as guides and pathfinders for settlers in crossing the mountains into the early California and Oregon in the 1840s. White settlers on the Western Front. Um, so most of these were, so think about at this time the West was California and Oregon, and the first settlers there, of course, were explorers. They were mountain men. Uh, white settlers on the Western Frontier. 
whether the frontier lay in Minnesota or Oregon or California in the 1840s and 50s, daily life was similar to that of the early colonists. They worked hard from sunrise to sunset, lived in log cabins, sod huts, uh, or improvised such, or improvised shelters. Uh, disease was probably the greatest a, greatest dangers uh, during this time. Women often living many miles from the nearest neighbor, pioneer women for moderate daily tax, including those of doctor, teacher, seamstress, and cook. Uh, the isolation and less work of these rigors of childbirth resulted in a short lifespan for women. So women would typically die of childbirth, uh, a lot of disease hazards in the Western frontier. Environmental damage. Settlers had little understanding of the fragile nature of land life. As settlers moved into an area, they would clear an entire forest. After only two generations, exhaust soil, exhaust soil with poor farming methods. At the same time, trappers and hunters brought the beaver and the buffalo to the brink of extinction. So a lot of extinction um, of uh, the natural. So it's a big picture here, chapter 9. Let's go through some of these. <sighs> okay. Start off here. So the nation was very fragile, of course, because there were a lot of sectionalist tensions. A lot of people didn't necessarily know to associate themselves with the section, like north-south, east-west, or their actual union. Okay. Uh, so I'm just going to go through some of these characteristics. I went through all the, most of these characteristics. I do want to go through, though. I want to go? Sorry, I do want to go through your references chart. Let's see some of the things that we did cover here. Uh, this is a fairly quick chapter. So period four. Sorry, guys. We talked vaguely about the Indian Removal Act, right? By 1850s, most Native Americans had moved westward. We also did talk about... Yeah, I mean, there really weren't too many key terms here. Uh, westward expansion was brought up, but we'll discuss that in a bit. Yeah, so that's a very quick chapter. Not, not many key terms.